On this video, um, I'd like to discuss um, England uh, and limited monarchy, um, which lasts basically from 1603 until 1689. Um, you can find uh, a, a section in um, your book in chapter 15 um, on this, but I'd like to go into it in a bit more detail. The book poses a question, um, which is how and why did England avoid um, the path to absolutism, which we've discussed in the previous videos. Um, and that's a pretty important question for the future of Europe. Why does this one country, um, and soon to be empire, avoid an absolutist government? Um, as we've seen, uh, France was... Uh, taken by um, an absolutist king, Louis XIV. Um, Prussia uh, was very much under um, the control of, of the Kaiser, the king, in this, um, in this case, Frederick uh, William, the great uh, elector. Uh, and soon uh, we'll be discussing his, his son, um, known simply as Frederick the Great, um, and, uh, of course, Russia, Russia being perhaps the, the most, the most absolutist country in all of Europe under, um, complete control of, of one person, the czar, um, who had, <clears throat> who had say over life and death and, uh, had, um, complete control over the military and so on. So why does, why is England different? Um, why does it not fall victim, if you will, to um, absolutist control? Well, the, the second part of the question, uh, why, I think can be answered um, fairly simply in that the English people had a sense of guaranteed liberties, rights, and freedoms that really no other uh, peoples in, in Europe had during the 17th century or before. Um, and this began um, long ago uh, in, the, in the 13th century um, with a document called the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was signed um, in the year 1215. And this was um, somewhat forced on, on the, the King of England at the time, um, King John, um, by both uh, the people of England and, and even, even the, the nobles who were tired of um, being taxed to the hilt. Uh, to pay for the king's wars, to pay for um, his his uh, every desire of luxury, etc. And uh, he signed this document. Um, and the Magna Carta has three very important basic principles which establish uh, English liberty. One is that all Englishmen, right, all Englishmen have basic rights sort of basic human rights as Englishmen. Uh, number two is that everyone was equal before the law. And no one, including the king, was above the law. You don't see anything like that uh, in Europe. Um, it, is a, it is a unique um, situation for England to have this. The third is um, sort of a leverage that um, the, the people have over the king, if you will. And that is that a legislative assembly would be created called the parliament, which uh, Great Britain still has, of course, the parliament. Uh, and the parliament um, would be made up of, of uh, the nobility, and a lesser nobility known as the gentry, um, and 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 this became a, sort of a bicameral legislative assembly 
um, the House of Lords and the House of Commons. And the most uh, powerful aspect of the Parliament was this leverage over the king uh, as it related to taxes, right? As I said, that had been one of the major reasons behind uh, the Magna Carta in the first place. The Parliament had the right and authority to modify taxes, not the king. If the king, say, wanted to go to war with France, he would have to go before Parliament and get uh, approval for uh, funds. Of course, that being uh, people would be taxed. Um, But he did not have this power himself. And so it's a, it's, it, be, it begins a very um, uh, strong bureaucracy where the, where the king has to sort of, if you, if you will think about it this way, he has to sort of play, play ball with the members of parliament and he has to, um, you know, more or less um, make them feel um, that, uh, that they're being... Uh, paid attention to, uh, but and 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 that he um, he has to be aware of how, how he sort of treats them, um, and that is a th- that also is 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 a part of what happens next in that uh, um, in that certain kings begin to as you can imagine kings and queens begin to resent that. Um, and this is based on something we, we have uh, mentioned previously, of course, the, the divine right of kings, and that a king or a queen was placed on the throne by God, uh, and therefore no one really should be able to um, have any authoritative power over um, that, that uh, monarch. And and of course in the rest of Europe that uh, is is plain 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 true, uh, but in England um, obviously it is different. And as I said, uh, the Magna Carta can be seen really as as is simply the the document um, which which gives the English people a, a sense of um, basic human rights. Um, and that is why um, they are able to um, fight uh, against any sort of absolutist uh, government or or absolutist king, um, and that is going to be sort of more uh, apparent. Um, the struggle between a king believing in the divine right of kings and wanting to exert that I- extent of power um, over his people and the people not only reacting to it but actually going to war with the king. And that's the period we're talking about, this period of the 17th century. So um, England and limited monarchy. Um, now we'll, we'll look at you know, how the English were able to avoid um, this type of government. And um, <clears throat> this begins really with the death of, of uh, Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth I. She died in the year 1603. Um, also in that year, the English and Scottish crowns uh, were united um, that is not to say that um, England and Scotland are now one kingdom, as we know today, the United Kingdom. But it is to say that the King of Scotland um, is also the King of England, and vice versa. Um, which is um, which is important because it now means that a Scottish king or Scottish noble family, to begin with, can become not only the king of Scotland, but now the king of England. And that's what happens in the year 1603. And uh, this is a family called the Stuarts. The Stuarts were Scottish. 
And they are now in a position to rule over um, England. This is the end of the, end of the Tudor dynasty of, of, as I said, Queen Elizabeth I and the beginning of the Stuart dynasty. The first king of which was James I, who ruled uh, England from 1603 until 1625. It's important to, to understand that a Scottish king would have very little understanding of the Magna Carta and these guaranteed rights and liberties, particularly the, the idea that the king is um, must ask for approval from Parliament for reasons of taxation, etc. Uh, because in Scotland, the the kings had absolute uh, or, or 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 certainly you know far more power than that in England. And this was because of the belief of the divine right of kings, right, that God had placed them on the throne. Um, and so from the beginning, James I has, let's say, difficulty adjusting to being the monarch of England. And uh, he was faced with a number of, of challenges uh, from the beginning, um, this was a, a this this was still during the period of, of the Protestant Reformation. If you remember from if you've taken World Civilization One, um, the Protestant Reformation began in fifteen seventeen and doesn't end until sixteen forty eight. So this is still during that period, <clears throat> and England faces its own sort of unique. Um, Protestant Reformation, if you will, in that uh, it leads to the creation of the Church of England, also known as the Anglican Church. Um, and so there were divisions based on religion within England. Um, there were, for instance, the Puritans who wanted to purify um, the Church of England, meaning they did not want to scratch it, get rid of it, start over but rather they wanted to purify it, meaning they wanted to get rid of any vestiges of Catholicism that were left, uh, for example, mass. Um, and then there was <clears throat> the Anglican establishment itself, who fully believed that the Church of England was the correct church. Um, then there were the Catholics, who uh, did not believe in the Church of England, they were Catholic, and they did not want to convert to Anglicanism, to the Church of England. And um, James had trouble with all of these different groups for various reasons. Um, he made a particularly um, harsh, if you, if you think about it, a really harsh um, punishment on, on the Catholics, even though James I was sort of a closet uh, Catholic himself. I say cause, uh, closet uh, Catholic because he, as the King of England, was also the head of the Church uh, of England. And so uh, he had to publicly, of course, um, present himself as the head of the Church of England, but sort of uh, was, a, was a closet um, Catholic. But the Catholics... Um, had had within England had not been, let's say, kind to to James because they wanted to see him come in and basically dissolve the Church of England and reestablish Catholicism in England, um, and he didn't do that because again the Church of England was a major part of his power as he was the head of it, <clears throat> and so there had been actually. Um, attempts on James James's life, assassination attempts by Catholics, and James uh, proceeded to issue the so-called Oath of Allegiance in the year 1606, which in basically forced all people of England to take in this oath, um, which made them basically say that the King of England was the... Um, the ultimate ultimate earthly authority, right, which for a Catholic at the time would have been basically impossible, because their ultimate earthly authority is the Pope, and this angered the Catholics to no end, 
And so James the first, his rule is um, is is a difficult one from the beginning. Um, in the second video, we will continue looking at, at James and the continuation of, of the Stuart family.